Welcome everyone to Aging in Action, and we're very happy to have with us Julie Obey from the Maison McCullough Hospice. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. Thank you so, so much uh, for having me here uh, on uh, September 30th. It's Truth and Reconciliation Day here at the hospice, and um, I'm coming to you live from our sunroom. Uh, so oh, how's, how's the sound? Is it a bit echoey? No, it's good. It's, it's okay. Good. And I, I know, I mean, my dad spent his last days at uh, the hospice and it's a beautiful place, actually. I know it's a, a sad time in everybody's life, but it's a beautiful setting where it is. And um, yeah, it, uh, I, there's been changes though, since he's been in there, You're, you've added on, right? Yeah, so it is a beautiful setting. Uh, we did add 10 additional beds. So it was originally a 10 bed residential hospice. Uh, we're now 20. Um, we have different bed types as well, uh, short stay beds, which I, I trust I'll get into a little later. Um, but you're right about the aesthetic. Um, so we are located on Bethel Lake. And, um, you know, the environment when people are going through uh, the end of life journey is is actually more important than one would think. Um, it can bring a lot of, uh, it can entice a lot of reflection, uh, conversation, uh, peace of mind. And so, you know, this, the, the views are stunning. Um, I don't know if, if I can, wow. if, if I can go this way, like yeah. we're the yeah. colors, the colors are just all the leaves are changing. Oh, yeah. beautiful. It's and nice uh, and so, of course, uh, of the 20 of the 20 beds that we have, 10 of them uh, have that view, have that lake view yeah. uh, of Bethel. And of course, we've got grounds uh, outside, a, a beautiful garden area and docks. Um, actually, we have a resident uh, that will be fishing momentarily um, mm. with one of our volunteers uh, off of one of the docks here. Oh, that's um, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just just beautiful. <clears throat> well, I remember too, uh, my sister and I spent many nights there sleeping in the one room, but it was, you had to, there was lots of people coming and going and of course other families too. And, and even on the the ledge of the window, we, uh, some of us slept there, you know, so it was nice, it was nice to have the opportunity to be there with him, like kind of round the clock, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's what the, that's what the environment is built for. So, um, as I indicated, 20 beds, um, you'll notice, uh, you'll notice behind me, perhaps right here, um, the door, the size of the door. So all of our doors are enlarged and all of our beds are on wheels here. So it's not uncommon uh, to see our residents in their beds wheeled out, you know, into the into the dining area, into the cafeteria, uh, into this sunroom proper. And even behind me, that door leads to an outdoor balcony. Um, so beautiful. We had uh, we had a resident and their partner here. And every day they visited on the outside balcony in the summertime. Well, didn't the resident pass away out there? Oh, beautiful. With their oh. pup and oh. them too and so then the family you know the family came in mm -hmm. and we had the family we just put a do not disturb on the door and the entire oh. family was out on the balcony for half the day mm -hmm. um you know just enjoying uh reminiscing um and coming to terms uh with their loved ones uh, end of life journey it's beautiful julie what would it look like for a family who know they're at their end of days and they're looking to okay maybe they need a hospice environment for multiple reasons and it's just a good fit for that family how do they start that where does the conversation start for families that are like wow maybe this is something i want to consider i love i love your question and thank you for it um so there there are a number of ways and so um you know the first the first way uh, is having that conversation with your physician. So we do we do require a referral um, to from a healthcare professional uh, to to be referred into this service. However, one of the things that we're really good at uh, is doing a, a, a back end approach, and so we invite people to call the hospice directly. Uh, and inquire about space, inquire about our beds, and even come for a tour. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, those are the biggest success stories. A lot of people, um, you know, when you hear hospice, you hear you're giving up. It's end of days, right? Uh, they, 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 it's a, such a negative connotation. And so 
for those people who can call us directly, we will circle back to their healthcare provider or to home and community care and get the referral paperwork um, that is required to access the service. So, so really, there are a number of ways, either directly through a healthcare provider or directly through us. You, you mentioned about uh, coming to and actually uh, the way we approached our dad, because when he heard the word hospice, he heard hospital. And so we put up the video that you had on your website so he could see how different it was that it wasn't this sterile looking hospital room or the grounds. And, and I think that gave him more peace. He still wasn't prepared to die, but um, just knowing that it was in a different setting than what he, he had told himself helped. Well, Gwen, that's a that's a really good point. And, and, you know, there's palliative care, but then there's hospice palliative care. And so, you know, what what a hospice environment does really well is they take care of and support the family. It's not just the resident, right. um, you know, that is needing those services. Right. And so um, we create the environment, you know, as we as we talked about, there's a lot of seating areas. And as you mentioned uh, with your loved one, yes, we've got built in beds in the ledge um, to be able to um, so that people can have overnight stays with their loved one, lots of family in yeah, the room. And so and, um, and, and so the environment, right, and the importance of the environment. And it's it's, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you know, the loved one, mom or dad, you know, in and out of consciousness or there's direct care that needs to happen. Um, you know, it's so nice. Uh, uh, that these families there's you know there's always fresh baking on the servery there's always a fresh pot of coffee you know it's so nice to see families gather at the coffee pot you know grab them help themselves um and then enjoy one of the seating areas and and you know cry yeah. um yeah laugh i found that area very helpful the kitchen i think it made yeah. you sort of feel again you're, you're you're gathering around the table and and even if your family wasn't there there was other family uh members of other people so it, it felt uh communal I guess it was just a, a good feeling well Gwen and, and and to your point and it's not even sometimes the other families it's all of the staff and so that's one thing um that you know so again I'm new I'm I'm a I'm a year and a half and and two months in uh to this environment as the executive director my entire career uh was working with older adults in retirement and long-term care so I'm, I'm I'm coming to the end of of, of that uh, continuum of care here uh, here at the hospice, um, but one of the things that just strikes me uh, to the core uh, is how special the staff are, and I and I've seen the recruitment process. I've seen you know positions that are open. Um, not everyone makes it through the orientation. Um, this is not this is not for everyone, but I'll tell you, everyone that we have in our employ here contributes to the experience of the family members and the residents from housekeeping to the cook, to the human resources manager, to the clinicians uh, at bedside. We all um, at any given time um, can come into a, a location where there's family sitting and we act as an extension uh, of the family. And in order to do that, um, you know, there's a lot of training uh, creation of culture that allows us to, to create that environment uh, where families do feel comfortable and do feel like family and, 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 and can sit and reminisce and have those difficult conversations. So I, I know the last time uh, that I was there was a few years ago. One of the things that I found very impactful was it didn't feel like a hospital just because the way everybody was dressed mm. it felt like the person I was visiting there just felt like he was in, this was his big family and it wasn't sterile. It was just, I think I saw a, a doctor with jeans and a, a t-shirt. And I just, I thought that was such a wow factor of, it just felt like a home, it, you know? Yeah, Lizette, it's it's true. We don't uh, we don't mandate a uniform. Um, our nurses are you know our nurses are in scrubs most of the time. It's rather casual. Um, but today I'm in I'm in jeans uh, and a, and a t shirt. I'll never forget my first day on the job. I <laughs> I showed up in a in a suit. 
Oh, uh, and, and it's like, no, no, this isn't going to work. <laughs> this isn't going to work because, you know, you have yeah. family members literally shuffling, shuffling around and, you know, in the, in the morning coffee bar, you're meeting right. someone in their house coat yep. um, because they spent a really rough night with mom. Yep. Yep. Um, and, you know, the last thing they want to do is talk to someone in a, in a, in a power so, switch. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it's, and uh, it's, it's little things uh, that we do, uh, all of us uh, as a collective, to, to make this environment homey and comfortable. And I remember taking years ago the um, core fundamentals of hospice care with the hospice and, you know, some of the training modules. And it was just a holistic, just empowering volunteer moment where it was like, wow, you can just make such a difference where you think it might be so small, but so big for someone else. And I, I, I've always taken that just to, to heart. Now, I know it pulls on our heartstrings, but you also have now have a piece of the hospice that actually climatized towards children, youth, individuals. And I know it's a, probably a topic that pulls on everyone's heartstrings. Um, that being noted, what has that been looking like for the hospice today? Yeah, so I'm, I'm so thankful to say uh, that we do not get a lot of children uh, here at the hospice. But unfortunately, uh, I did experience uh, a, a young guest, a young resident rather, um, a four-year-old. Oh. And uh, so that was the first time uh, since the uh, expansion uh, mm -hmm. that we're, we were able to use our pediatric family room. And so what it is, is that with uh, younger residents, um, the parents want to remain the primary caregiver uh, right to the end. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you, when you move in a young resident, you're moving in their family as well. And so they need living space. Uh, this family in particular, there were three other children um, and, and, and mom and dad and extended family. And so one of the things they did uh, when they did the expansion was build a, um, a living quarters uh, that, has, that has two adjacent doors to both resident rooms on either side. And so what essentially happened is that the family moved into the living quarter and then we opened the door and it became like a one bedroom apartment. Oh. And so, yeah, and so the family had, um, you know, that space uh, to, to be private, but also, you know, where they could come in and out of uh, their, their child's room um, as they were receiving the support uh, from, our, from our nurses and physicians. So brilliant. Uh, we just got, uh, we got a $10,000 uh, donation from the Shrine Club, uh, timely, timely donation about a month before um, we had this resident. And so what we did is we, uh, we have the bedrooms, bedroom in a box. And so for the idea is that we have, uh, you know, a bedroom that would be conducive to a young boy uh, in a box and ready to get ready to rock. Um, so that if we do get someone that's going to be coming in, we outfit uh, the resident room, we've got, you know, the Spider-Man posters and the, and the, and the Lightning McQueen and the Paw Patrol, you know, all that great stuff. And then, you know, to have a bedroom in a box for a young girl, then a bedroom in a box for an older boy and a bedroom in a box for an older girl. Right. And so we've got the funds to do that. Um, we also, uh, we also with that, now this wasn't on time for this family. Um, I don't know if everyone's heard of the virtual, virtual reality goggles. Yep. Oh yeah. So we also purchased uh, some some virtual reality goggles so that we could give uh, families a, a virtual reality experience together, um, you know, while they're while they're here in in hospice uh, and connecting the goggles together and also a device that allows a family member to see what the person is experiencing on the television um, while they're while they're experiencing Aww. it. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, we were able, um, you know, we were able to welcome um, this young resident uh, in a room that was custom uh, to this little guy's um, needs and likes at the time. And I think, um, you know, as difficult a journey, I mean, I have children, um, as, as difficult a journey as I can only imagine it was, um, I do know uh, that it made it easier, uh, more, more bearable. Mm -hmm. on the family. And 
And you just actually touched on a really good point, the donation part. You're not funded, like there's no charge for these families coming to spend their, their moments and their quality time with their, their families and loved ones. What does that look like? If you, Obviously, fundraising has changed a lot in the last few months. Um, you know, we're coming back to some, you know, opportunities. And I think we've all utilized different components in technology. So if someone wants to make a donation to the hospice or it's something, how do they look? How do they approach you? Where does that look? How does that look? We do have a, through our website, we do have an online, um, it's donate. Uh, and, and you press that button, it takes you right into the, uh, the donation platform. And the great thing about donating online is that people get their tax receipts right away. Mm -hmm. um, so it's brilliant. You get that, you get that tax receipt right in your inbox and uh, you're good to go. Um, we do have events uh, throughout the year uh, to be able to raise these funds, but I want to talk about, you know, it, so I come from retirement, which is all private pay, but also long-term care, which is funded uh, by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. It, it absolutely blows my mind that hospices in Ontario have to fundraise for the cost of food, for the cost of cleaning supplies, housekeeping wages, cook wages, maintenance wages, utilities, medical supplies. These are not funded. The only thing that is funded for a hospice is the wage of a PSW, an RN, or an RPN. Mm -hmm. That is it. Absolutely everything else relies 100% on fundraising. Wow. I don't think everybody mm -hmm. knows that, yeah. No, I, 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 I we're, we're lobbying as a collective. So there's a Hospice Palliative Care Ontario uh, is an, is a, um, voluntary association that represents uh, hospices in Ontario. And through them, um, we are trying to lobby to at least uh, receive funding for all clinical costs. So medical supplies, cleaning supplies, anything for infection control, et cetera. Um, in addition, of course, to the clinical wages um, and also to get funding for our grief and supportive care program. So we're not just a residential hospice. Um, we offer grief, what we call grief and supportive care. And so two kinds of grief, right? So there's anticipatory grief. Mm -hmm. So when someone is about to pass away, right? And coming to terms with that um, and, and grieve the losses that they've already had, which is not loss of life, but it could be loss of mobility, loss of independence, et cetera, right? And so we have a team here on site that does that and focuses with that, not, again, not only with the resident, but their family. And then that same team offers grief and supportive, uh, grief uh, support to people that have lost a loved one. It doesn't necessarily have to have lost a loved one in one of our programs or with us at the residential hospice. Anybody who is suffering a loss and who needs assistance with their grief, right? That entire program is unfunded. And that relies on community grants. I mean, United Way is a huge partner of ours. Extremely thankful to them uh, for subsidies for the program, but it doesn't cover everything. Mm -hmm. And we, that's, so that's part of our fundraising effort. Our volunteer program is another program. So we have volunteers, 30 hours of training, robust training, and then hands, in addition to hands-on training, these guys have a specific calling in life. It's a special person and their bedside, wherever somebody calls home, whether that's in hospital in long-term care uh, in their own homes. Again, we have some funding for that. We need to fundraise for the rest. And then of course we have our community hospice palliative care program. So these are nurses and physicians, okay, that will create a pl care plan, uh, pain management plan, and they wrap it around people that want to die at home. Hmm. That program does receive funding. Again, those are clinical staff, as I mentioned, we do get funding for the nurses, but it's not, again, it's not entirely yeah. funded. And there's a growth in demand that is going to call for more donations if we can't get more funding from the government. So yeah, it, it, it blows my mind that such a vital service uh, you know, and, 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 and a helpful service in terms of creating capacity for the community in our local hospital, mm -hmm. you know, is, is, 
is partially unfunded and that we have to raise uh, we have to raise money. So having said that, we rely heavily on the generosity of people living in our community. I think it's um, sad that we have to lobby that it's not recognized um, today as especially today, given the circumstances in the last few years, where now individuals are making a little bit more choice on that journey for themselves, whatever that may look like, that you have to basically fight for the dollars. And I think that's very unfortunate um, when you look, but I do agree right now with the charitable campaign happening, right, United Way, um, you know, I'm the first to, to knock and say, hey, you know, don't just give here, look at our community and what's available for, but there's so many services that are in need today and just locally. Mm -hmm. I know where we're going to be cutting our time short. The one thing that I do want to ask is what area, I know we have beautiful hospice in, in Northern Ontario from Sault Ste. Marie, North Bay, ourselves here, Greater Sudbury, what area are, is the that your clientele base can come from? Like how far out catchment wise, just in case somebody's listening, Elliot Lake, Espanola, the island, and they, they, they're inquiring themselves. So I love that question. And I never know really how to answer it. And I'll tell you why. Um, where we've had demand from say outlying areas like, like Manitoulin, um, you know, uh, where we, we even we even took in someone from Ottawa um, and, and, and the, and the premise there is it's like, they have family members that are in the city proper, uh, mm -hmm. or in and around the city. And mm -hmm. so this would be the closest hospice, um, you know, you know, to them. And so they want to bring mom or dad, you know, they have them transferred and we can do that. Perfect. That we can do that. Um, and, and so just important to note, or if there is a capacity issue in the city that they are in, um, you know, certainly we will facilitate transfer and, and, and referral uh, to be able to support these individuals. So we're coming down, and I know this has just went so fast this time with us. We're coming down to that last end of our conversations for today. Any last words, anything you want to share that you want to bring to the attention to our community before we end? talk about us talk mm -hmm. about you know someone someone used the term and I laughed and I thought my god that's clever and I'm going to use that talk about your exit strategy <laughs> yeah right? I agree Great. okay inevitable be, right <laughs> be in control be yeah. in control of it okay mm -hmm. no one has a crystal ball but we have seen people uh, with life limiting illness since the dawn of time. And we know certain uh, trajectory points in that illness. We know what it's going to look like. And you know, your physician knows what it's going to look like. And so get a handle on that, learn about it, and then ask yourself, where do you want to be? How do you want to manage when you reach that turning point, those turning points Thank in you. your trajectory? Thanks, Julie. <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. We are again, I know we, we definitely got to start doing parts one, two, three, because it's just oh, such an important much, yeah. Um, note. Of, yeah, but we are coming to the end of today's uh, taping. And as you can hear, I just got told. Um, <laughs> uh, so you know, that little thing's coming into our world. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today on yeah. our this episode of Aging in Action. We're going to share all the information of our local hospice, every, anything that we can within the community. Um, thank you so much, Julie, for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today on Aging in Action. And we look forward to having another wonderful conversation next week. Thank you. Thank you so much.